Good afternoon, everyone. I wish to welcome you to this second in our series of webinars on Vatican II. Um, we are uh, offering this series as part of our preparation for uh, the year 2025, the Jubilee, uh, when we will um, celebrate the Great Jubilee uh, under the theme of Pilgrims of Hope. A, rem a reminder that Pope Francis asked that we try to revisit these documents of Vatican II and Magisterium since then to understand their implications for us in our own time. And so that's why we've, we've decided to um, move forward with this. And we'll say the Jubilee Prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father in heaven, may the faith you have gifted us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our brother, and the flame of charity kindled in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, reawaken in us the blessed hope for the coming of your kingdom. May your grace transform us into diligent cultivators of the evangelical seeds that make humanity and the cosmos rise unto the confident expectation of the new heavens and the new earth, when with the powers of evil overcome, your glory shall be manifested eternally. May the grace of the Jubilee reawaken in us pilgrims of hope, the yearning for heavenly treasures, and pour over all the earth the joy and peace of our Redeemer. To you, God, blessed in eternity, be praise and glory forever and ever. Amen. So last week, we were privileged to have an excellent presentation on the Constitution on Sacred Liturgy. And of the 10 principles of liturgical reform that Monsignor Kretsch spoke of, about the place of scripture, he said, the renewed emphasis on the scripture in the liturgy and in Christian life is in my mind, one of the most striking aspects of the liturgical reform called for by the council. So building on this theme, we come to our second webinar with a reflection on De Verboom, the Constitution on Divine Revelation. Uh, Bishop Donald Hying, in, in an article on the subject, has written, De Verboom encourages all Catholics to read, study, and meditate on the Bible daily, drawing knowledge, inspiration, and grace from the perseverance of daily encounters with the Word of God, Jesus Christ, who speaks to us in the words of the Bible. Today, we are honored to have Bishop Ivan Matthew, Auxiliary Bishop of Ottawa, Cornwall, to help us unpack the key principles and vision of De Verboom. Bishop Ivan was born in Quebec City in 1961. He attended the Marist Fathers High School in Quebec City, where he graduated in 1976 and continued his studies at the Petit Seminar de Quebec. In, seven, in 1979, he entered the novitiate of the Marist Fathers in Washington, D.C., and made his first vows in 1980. He was ordained to the priesthood on August 15, 1987. He studied theology at St. Paul University from 1980 to 1984. He worked at the Seminaire des Pères Maristes in Quebec City in 1984 to 1989. And he studied at the Pont Pontificio Institute Biblico in Rome in 1989 to 1993, where he graduated with an SSL. After two years of ministry in Quebec City, he came back to St. Paul University to do his doctorate. He graduated in 2000, and his dissertation was on the portrait of Peter in Luke, uh, Luke Acts, and was published in French in 20, 2004. From 2000 until 2022, Father Mathieu was a professor of Old Testament and Biblical Languages in the Faculty of Theology at St. Paul University. In July 2014, he became Dean of the Faculty of Theology. Father Mathieu also served in parishes on weekends, preached retreats, gave conferences and, and collaborations with three homo, collaborated with three homiletical reviews, Prion en Iglesia, Vie liturgique and foyer biblique. From January 1st until 2019, 
2019 until March 17, 2022, he was Provincial Superior of the Canadian Marist Fathers. And on March 17, 2022, he was appointed Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Ottawa, Cornwall, and titular Bishop of Vasari. He, was, he is ordained Bishop on Monday, June 13th at the Ottawa Cathedral by Archbishop Marcel Danfous. Please welcome Bishop Ivan Mathieu. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour, tout le monde. Bonjour. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, welcome. Thank you to give me the chance to be able to work with you on Dei Verbum this afternoon. I'm going to start by sharing my screen and what I've prepared. So, can everybody see this uh, slide? That's on the screen? I, I guess so. If there's any problem, Margaret, uh, let me know, and uh, you can stop me while I'm talking here. I would like to start my presentation with uh, by uh, citing, quoting the Constitution of uh, the, the first number by listening religiously and giving with insurance the word of God. The council makes his the words of St. John. We proclaim to you eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us and that our fellowship may be with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is why, following in the footsteps of the councils of Trent and Vatican I, he intends to propose the authentic doctrine of divine revelation and its transmission, so that on hearing the proclamation of salvation, the whole world may believe, hope, and by believing they hope, and by hoping they love. Right from the start, the dogmatic constitution cites the word of God. We'll come back to the choice of 1 John 1, 2 to 3 to open the constitution on revelation. It's important to note, first of all, that in dealing with divine re revelation, the Second Ca Vatican Council intends to follow in the footstep of two other councils, Trent and Vatican I, to propose the authentic doctrine of divine revelation and its transmission. This seems to me to indicate that in order to read the Constitution properly, we need to take note of the our historical background that underpins it. Since we could have done, uh, we could have talked about this uh, in general, but uh, we wouldn't have had enough time to read the Constitution. Since the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, the way in which God reveals himself to human beings has been the job object of great controversy. Who hasn't heard the expression sola scriptura? Sorry. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. The uh, wording, it's, um, it's reform. It offers a second question. How was divine revelation transmitted? Was scripture the only source of divine revelation? Or did God reveal salvific truth through both scripture and church tradition those truths of apostolic faith that were not written down in the Bible. And if so, what was the relationship between scripture and tradition? So the first question, what is the source of the revelation, the writings alone, or the scriptures with the tradition. Another issue in the long debate that began with the Reformation concerns the science of biblical interpretation. In the years leading up to the Second Council, 
modern linguistic studies, modern archaeology, and modern methods of analyzing, analyzing ancient texts radically changed our understanding of the humanity of ancient writings. How were these methods of inquiry deployed by Catholic biblical exegetes? exegetes who believed they were seeking to understand the word of God written in human words. Enlightenment rationalism treated ancient religious texts as literary corpse to be dissected. The church obviously couldn't accept this, but how could the vitality of scripture be restored so that words of God in the Bible would break the silence of a world that imagined itself to have moved beyond religion. Was it possible to use modern tools of biblical interpretation without reducing the Bible to a collection of legends and fables? And if so, how? How to do it? These are two questions that was within the, uh, the people who had to write uh, these uh, constitutions. And the source of the revelation, the writing, or the writings and the traditions, and how to use the tools, the modern tools of interpretation of the Bible to be able to understand the word of God that was written. The resolution of these questions was essential so that the Catholic Church can proclaim with insurance the truth in the modern world. And the resolution, resolving these issues was also as important today. Let's start by remembering so that this document that we have today, before it came to happen, it was a long gestation period and the birthing was quite hard. At the first session of the Council, an outline on Revelation was proposed to the Fathers under the title Sources of Revelation. From the outset, it implied a duality between scripture and tradition. This document, it was, uh, above all, this document was a reworking of the neo-scholastic theology found in dogmatic manuals. Its vision of revelation was propositional. We were asking, giving a proposition, and it would make little use of the biblical renewal movement that had begun to flourish in the decades preceding, preceding the Council uh, since 1944 with the letter uh, Divino Afluto Spiritu. The exegetes could work a little bit more freely, but we didn't see the fruits of this in the first project that was offered in 1962. After an uh, impassionate discussion, Cardinal Coupa would tell us 1,368 votes would cast to reject the project, which was accepted by only 822 votes. This vote on Monday, November 19, 1962, plunged the Council into difficulty as the necessary two-thirds majority was not achieved. There was a lot of people that were against, but not enough. Emotions ran high in the Aula Conciliar, and the Roman Conciliabula went into overdrive that evening. It wouldn't take too long, because the very next day, Jean, John 23, using his authority, withdrew the diagram from discussion and entrusted its revision to the special commission made up of members of the doctrinal commission and the secretariat from Christian unity to whom he added a few cardinals. It was a long and slow process involving the maturing of clearly divergent points of view between supporters of the two sources and advocates. 
advocates of one single one. A second very brief text was submitted to the fathers on April 22, 1963, but was never discussed. A third draft was submitted to the Council from September 20th to October 6, 1964. A rich discussion led to a new draft, the fourth, which was put to the vote by paragraph by paragraph, from September 20th to the 29th of October, 1969. The final text, the, the one we're reading this afternoon, the fifth, was nevertheless voted almost unanimously on November 18th, 1965, by 2,344 2, votes to six, and immediately promulgated. Paul VI uh, promulgated promulgated it quickly. I would like that. That's the context in which we are. Uh, the document had been uh, given. What I'd like to do is would like to try to see what are the big affirmations that we can keep from this document. The first great affirmation of Dei Verbum divine revelation is real. And here I'd like to uh, quote uh, number two. It pleased God in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself in person and to make known the mystery of his will, thanks to which men, through Christ, at the, by the through Christ, the Word made flesh, gain access in the Holy Spirit to the Father, and are made partakers of the divine nature. Through this revelation, the invisible God addresses to the mankind in her his superabundant love as friends, conversing with them to invite and admit them to serve his own life such an economy of such an economy of revelation comprises actions and words intimately bound together so that the works accomplished by god in salvation history attest and corroborate both the doctrine and the meaning indicated by the words while the words proclaim the works and illuminate the mystery they contain, the profound truth that this revelation manifests about God and man's salvation shines forth for us in Christ, who is both the mediator and the fullness of all revelation. My computer is not collaborating this morning. Sorry about that. So what's important to note in this second point is that God does not reveal to us a collection of information, but rather God shares God's very self with us. What we see here is a more personalist model of divine revelation. I don't have a, I'm not communicating a doctrine, but we're communicating dog, God himself. God comes to us as a person, Jesus Christ, who is both the mediator and the sum total of revelation. We understand better why the Constitution is open to the citation, the quote of the first letter of Jean. We call you the uh, eternal life, which was with the Father and which has come to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you have fellowship with us and that our fellowship may be with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> So, this personal revelation begins with creation and continues with election of Abraham and his descendants. You can see Dei Verbum number three, and it's culminating in Christ. I'm going to read you number four. After having spoken many times and in many ways through the prophets, God, in these last days, has spoken to us through his Son. He sent his Son, 
He sent his son, the eternal word, who enlightens all men to dwell among them and make known to them the depth of God. Jesus Christ, then, the word made flesh, man sent to man, speaks of the words of God and completes the work of salvation that the Father gave him to do. So it is he to see him is to see the Father, who by his very presence and by the manifestation he makes of himself through his works and deeds, through his signs and wonders, and most particularly through his death and glorious resurrection from the dead, and finally, through the standing of the Spirit of Truth, completes revelation by fulfilling it and confirms it further by divinely attesting that God himself is with us to rescue us from the darkness of sin and death and to raise us to eternal life and to for eternal, to raise us for eternal life. In Dei Verbum, then, the Second Vatican Council taught that God reveals himself, not just propositions about himself, and does so through both deeds and words in a process that culminates in Jesus Christ. In a similar way, Vatican II resolved the debate over whether divine revelation had one source or two, scripture alone or scripture and tradition. That debate, Dei Verbum suggested, was miscast. There is one source of revelation. God himself. And God makes himself, not just ideas about himself, he makes himself known to humanity through both scripture and those truths that come to us through apostolic tradition of the church describes their relationship and dogmatic unity in these terms. And here I will uh, quote uh, extracts from 9 and 10 of the Constitution. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture are therefore closely linked and communicate with each other for both springing from the same divine source form a single whole, so to speak, and tend towards the same end. Indeed, sacred scripture is the word of God insofar as under the inspiration of the divine spirit it is recorded in writing. As for sacred tradition, it is bears the word of God entrusted by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit to the apostles. La Sainte Tradition de, et la Sainte Écriture constituent un unique dépôt sacré de la parole de Dieu. Alors, notons au passage ici la dimension trinitaire de la révélation. Let us note the Trinitarian dimension of revelation. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches us that God is radically personal as well as relational. The God who wishes to share the fullness of the divine life within us speaks a definite, unsurpassable word of love in Christ Jesus. This word, Christ, is the total sum of all revelation. All that is God wishes all that all that God wishes to offer is God's self in, in, through Christ. And the doctrine of the Trinity helps us understand that our God has an eternal event or, or perfect divine self communication. Now, the second major statement of Dei Verbum, divine revelation, is valid for all times and valid for all times and all peoples. It continues to be offered to humanity through the church. And here I'm going to quote a number 
from the Council. At number eight. To all generations. And this is why Christ the Lord, in whom all the revelation of the Most High God is completed, created a missionary church. And, and for God, Jesus gave his disciples the right to preach, communicating to them the divine gifts. But to ensure that the gospel was always kept intact and alive in the church, the apostles left bishops as their successors to whom they entrusted their own teaching function. This holy tradition and the sacred scriptures of both testaments are therefore like a mirror in which the church, on her earthly journey, contemplates God, from whom she receives everything and until she is brought to see him face to face, as he is. And a bit further on, thus, God who once spoke never ceases to converse with the bride of his beloved son. Here we're talking, of course, with, with the church. God talks with the church and with the Holy Spirit, through whom the living voice of the church, of the gospel, resounds in the church and through the church and introduces the believers to the whole truth and makes the word of Christ dwell in them with all its richness. The apostles left to the bishops the, the, the teaching role in this, the teaching of both Testaments are therefore, sorry, either the Constitution repeats itself or I, I miswrote that what you have here. I think the, the mistake was mine. Thus, God, who spoke previously, talks with the, sp the spouse. No, this is something I've already said, I think. Sorry. My mistake was in the order of the presentation of the paragraphs. The scriptures are a permanent reality in the church in that new books are not added to the Bible over time. We can say that the canon, the list of inspired texts, is over with. So we're not adding anything to the Bible over time, even if we have another, if we would have received another, saw another gospel, the canons would not change, the canon would not change. But the church's understanding of the word of God in the Bible develops nevertheless. And likewise, the revealed truths that the church hands on from generation to generation in her tradition are not a static patrimony. Catholicism is a dynamic reality. I'm quoting Dei Verbum number eight. And the, as Catholicism is a dynamic reality, and as the, as the centuries go by, the Church is always advancing towards the plenitude of divine truth until the words of God are fulfilled within her. And I quote number eight here. Doctrinal development was only that, was a development, and wasn't a rupture with the past in the form of, par of a paradigm shift. We'll come back at the end of my intervention on this. And the guardians of authentic, of the authentic, of the authentic doctrine was not the theologians, but it was the living teaching office of the church located in all the popes, the bishops, 
within the will, will of the Christ. In other words, this is the magisterium. Here I repeat, text from the Consul, the responsibility of inter interpreting the Word of God written or passed on was entrusted to the magisterium whose off official teaching is exercised in the, in, in, to, through the cusp. This magisterium is not be above the word of God. It's at its service, teaching that what was passed on because through the mandate of God, with the help of the Holy Spirit, this word is listened with love and keep it holy and with fidelity. And everything that is presented has been is relieved, has been, re has been released by God. So the Holy Scriptures and the Magisterium of the Church are solely linked up and in solidarity that none of these realities can exist on its own. And together, each one in its own way, under the, the acts of the Holy the, the Spirit, contributes to the salvation of souls. So after having said that revelation is true, and it is good in all places and all times, the third statement now from Dei Verbum is that it's not a statement, it's an openness, I would say. Dei Verbum made the Bible, gave the Bible back to the people, placed the Bible at the heart of the mission of evangelization and the catechesis, in the catechesis also. Let us remember, the scriptures are the soul of the theology. Theologian in the 20th century, as people who wanted to combat, recognize the limits, and people have worked hard to give to Catholic thought a more solid foundation. And this appeared in the text itself. Number 11, the divine revealed realities contained and presented in the books of sacred scripture have been recorded therein under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Our Holy Mother Church, through the apostolic faith, holds sacred and canonical all the books of both the Old and the New Testament. They have God as their author. They have been handed down as such to the church in herself. To compose these sacred books, God chose humans to whom he had recourse in the full use of their faculties and of their means so that God, acting in them and through them, they were able to put in writing as true authors all that was in conformity with God's desire and that only. So this is very, very important to see that is the author of the scriptures. But the sacred authors that are not just secretaries, however, that are writing things down on the paper. On the paper. So the Bible teaches faithfully, without mistakes, the, what God wanted to present in the sacred letters for our salvation. So for our salvation are very important. The Bible was not in competition with astronomy, astrophysics, history, geology, or any other human science. The truthfulness of the scriptures involved the sick salvific truth contained that were contained in the biblical text as far as far the, the salvation and as for the four canonical Gospels, the Council taught about their historical reliability, that the creativity of their authors and their character as a written form 
of charismatic proclamation. That's the proclamation of basic good proclamation. So, our Holy Mother Church has firmly held and holds on still with great constancy that these four Gospels, whose history she affirms without hes hesitation, faithfully transmit what Jesus, the Son of God, in his life among humans, did and taught for their eternal salvation right up to the day that it was taken up away into heaven. In fact, what the Lord had said and done, the apostles after his ascension passed on to their hearers with that deeper understanding of things which they themselves, instructed by Christ's glorious events and enlightened by the light of the spirit of truth, what they enjoyed. So here it's important to rem remember this story of Emmaus, where, where, where the risen Lord came and opened up this, the minds of the two disciples to what the scriptures were just saying. And they did that with the help of the Holy Spirit. So four gospels are written. And some elements were passed on or, orally. We don't have all the, di the dimensions that are here, but this is a summary of others or explaining them according to the situation of the church or the churches, finally keeping the form of a preaching so as to always deliver to, the, to its true and sincere and, and true and sincere things about Jesus. So revelation is true and valid for all times and all places. Secondly, thirdly, the role of the authors, the word was given back to the church. And fourth major statement is the response to the second question that is, we are always facing, what is the theology of Revelation? How can we use modern tools of biblical interpretation to understand the Word of God written in human words? So whoever has done an introductory course to the Bible know what they're talking about here. The discussion over more than 100 years on how the Catholic as it is used or not, the new methods, including the historical critical method. The key paragraph is paragraph 12. After ruling on the inspiration and truth of sacred scriptures, on paragraph 11, Dei Verbum declares, however, since God in sacred scripture spoke through humans, as humans are, the interpreter of sacred scripture, in order to see clearly what God himself wished to communicate to us, must search carefully for what the hagiographers, the, the writers of the holy books, really meant, and what it pleased God to convey through their words, which were to discover the intention of the hagiographers, or the authors we must consider also, the literary John. For example, when Jesus talks about a parable, it's not the same literary gender as when the church says what Jesus did and what he taught. Because it's a very different way, says the council, the truth is conveyed and expressed in, in different historical, prophetic, poetic, or, his, or historical texts, or even in other genre of expressions. So the respect of the literary gender type is very important. Consequently, the interpreter must seek out the meaning of the writer in given circumstances and conditions of his time and his culture, employing the literary gender, gender genre that was then used, intended to express, and did it 
In fact, it is to say here I'd like that when we reread the Gospel of Luke and, and the Acts of the Apostles, Rebel Sir, that Luke was wanted to write the history of Jesus and the beginnings of the church. But the way in which he writes does not follow the rules that we would use to write the history of, or of, an event, of the event of Jesus and of the beginnings of the church. He followed rules how history was written then in his time. In fact, to discover what the author wanted to state, we have to be careful of the way the people felt, the way it spoke, or history was stated at the time of the author to were rewritten in the books of the time. However, because Holy Scriptures must be read and interpreted in the light of the same Spirit who caused it to be written, it's not necessary to, to, it's not necessary in order to discover the exact meaning of sacred text to pay less attention to the content and unity of the whole Scriptures having regard in a living tradition of the whole church and the analogy of faith. Here, the council invites us not to read texts in isolation, but in the context of the whole canon. It's up, it is up to the exegetes, the historians, theological historians. I'm trying to find my note here, my, where I'm at. Following the rules to penetrate and expound more deeply the meaning of the sacred scriptures so that th through their studies, as it, were, is, it was preliminary, the judgment of the church may mature. For everything that concerns the interpretation of scripture is ultimately subject to the judgment of the church which exercises the ministry and the mandate divinely received to guard the word of God and also to interpret it. I'd like to have this had to be added with the, 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 commission, the commission, uh, biblical commission. There's a document of 1993 here produced by the Pontifical Biblical Commission in 1993, that's 30 years ago now. And I was finishing my, stu my studies at the biblical faculty, and this document was a source of much discussion and presents things very interesting. So, to start, this document presents the different approaches and methods that we can submit the analysis of the biblical text. What's interesting here is that of all the methods and approaches presented in this document, usually the, the, the commission, the biblical commission says we were for or against. No, they're not against this. They present the advantages and the, limit, the limits of each method. And the only method that's rejected is fundamentalism, which is quite interesting. At the same time, this opens up the, the important doors. It comes to complete what the council said, because with paragraph 12, the council allowed the exegetes to use the different methods, histor historical critical methods, and the old ultimate goal was to discover what was the intention of the author. However, we must recognize we don't have access to these authors. They've passed away, and they're probably awaiting us up in the, high, in the sky when we have the beatific vision. But what's interesting is this is document taken into, took into account the her philosophical hermeneutics. And I'd like to quote the introduction to this book in Fides, 
by Father Marcel Dunevin, an exegete who was my director of my thesis, and he, he was a member of the Pontifical Biblical Commission when this document was produced. And in his introduction, he invites us to, to take into account that because of the contemporary philosophy, we can't read the text anymore, only taking into account the, uh, who the author was. But there are three other elements that we have to take into account. The author, the text itself, and the reader. So it's by taking into account these three other points, these three elements, that we can see what is the wealth of the meaning of the text. And he adds the following. The biblical reading has meaning that the author might not have thought about. It's the biblical text in its ultimate statement and not, not previous uh, previous attempts, which is recognized as the norm in our faith life. In sort of, in sort of way that it's, we're not uh, the Christ critical historical system, we don't have to go up, only up back to the intention of the author. We have to give ourselves means so that our, the analysis of the final text can bring out the meaning that all the meaning it could have. And that meaning was not always uh, important. It's, and it's important to pick up the meaning that a text can have on the reader. There's method, different methods, and I don't want to enter into technicality here, that can allow us today, and they were very well presented in this little booklet 30 years ago. So I'm not going to come back to my slides, if you allow me. Now, I would like to conclude my presentation because time is flying. It's talking about the relevancy of Dei Verbum. You know that in October, there was the first session of the Synod on Synodality. It started on the 4th of October. And just before the opening of the Synod, Pope Francis took time to respond to Five dubia. Dubia is a question, uh, a doubt, a doubtful question that was presented to him, presented to him in, in, by five cardinals in July. So I, what I want to do to show the relevancy of what we just re read is to give you the response that Francis makes to the first dubium. First doubt. The first doubt relates to the claim that divine revelation should be reinterpreted in the light of an ongoing cultural and anthropological changes. So I quote the Vatican News, following the statements made by certain bishops, which have neither been corrected or retracted, the question arises as to whether divine revelation in the church should be reinterpreted according to the cultural changes of our times and according to the new anthropological vision that these changes promote. Or, or whether divine revelation is binding for all time, immutable, and not to be contradicted according to that which was dictated at the Second Vatican Council, which stipulates that God who reveals is himself, herself is due to the obedience of the obedience of all, is due and it needs to be transpassed on to all, revelation, all generations and that the, the understanding of intelligence of faith, progress of intelligence implies no change in the truth of things and words because faith has been handed down once and for all and that the magisterium is not superior to the word of God. Here's the response of by Pope Francis. Dear brothers, 
Although I don't always think it prudent to answer questions that are addressed directly to me, and that it would be impossible to answer them all, in this case, I felt it appropriate to do so because of the proximity of the upcoming synod. Answer to the first question. The answer depends on the meaning attributed to the word reinterpret. If it's understood as to interpret better, then the expression is valid. In this sense, the Vatican II Council has stated that it's necessary that through the work of exegetes, and I would add theologians, necessary that through the work of the exegetes and theologians, the judgment of the church should mature or become more mature. However, therefore, if it is true that divine revelation is immutable and always binding, the church must be humble and recognize that it never is able to exhaust the unfathomable richness and that it needs to grow in its understanding. By therefore, the church also grows in its understanding of what it has itself stated through the magisterium. The cultural changes in the new challenges of history do not alter revelation, but can stimulate us in order to better express certain dimensions of its overflowing richness which offers us always more. E. It is inevitable that this may lead to a better expression of certain past magisterial aff affirmations, and this has indeed happened in and during the course of history. F. On the other hand, it is true that the magisterium is not superior to the word of God, and it's also true that both the texts of the scriptures and the, and the witnessing of the tradition need an interpretation that makes it possible to distinguish their perennial substance from cultural conditioning. This is evident, for example, in biblical texts, such as Exodus 21, 20, 21, and in certain magisterial interventions that have tolerated, tolerated slavery. G. I'm trying to find my text. This is not a secondary argument, given its intimate link to the eternal truth of the inalienable dignity of the human person. These texts must be interpreted and interpreted. And same thing when we talk about uh, women in the New Testament and other texts witnessing of the, the tradition, which cannot be repeated as they stand today. We're asked to do a her hermeneutic in the scriptures as well as in tradition. It is important to note uh, that what cannot change is what has been revealed or from the salvation for the salvation of all. Consequently, the church must constantly discern what is essential for salvation and what is secondary or less directly related to this goal. I would like to recall what uh, St. Thomas d'Aquinas said, the deeper we go into the details, the greater the indeterminacy and finally, the last element of answer of Pope Francis, finally, the single formulation of truth can never be adequately understood if it is presented in isolation, isolated from the rich and harmonious context of the whole revelation. 
the hierarchy of truth also implies placing each truth in proper connection with more central truth and with the teaching of the church as a whole. This can eventually lead to different ways of expounding the same doctrine, even if for those who dream of a monol monolithic doctrine defending but by all without nuances, this may seem an imperfect dispersion, but in reality, this variety helps to better manifest and develop the different aspects of the inexhaustible richness of the gospel. And the Pope finishes by saying, every theological trend entails risk, but also opportunities. And you're going to allow me, it's not because I don't want to give the conclusion at Pope Francis, but I think uh, the word of conclusion should be uh, by Father Yves Congard. He was writing in uh, the information, international reports of every day of the council. Every day of the council. So let's, here is what he wrote the day that the Constitution des Verbes was adopted. It was, it's a beautiful text, a lot of uh, strength in it. It proposes a notion of revelation that goes beyond the conception that is intellectual and almost uh, philosophical. The revelation as is the first step of God in regards to link and create a link with us. The faith and the principle is offered to totally to God. The tradition is seen here clearly to all the people. And, and this subject, we're talking about development. The text also says the liberty of the exegetes and the fidelity that is necessary. They also talk about uh, the usage of the writings and the strictures inside the church. So I hope that uh, this presentation will have given you the taste to be able to go and reread the Verbum, but also to read the scriptures. I would cite uh, my Hebrew teacher when I came to Pontific in 1989, and she was saying that a lot of people are trying to go see a comet before writing their homily. And she said this, don't forget to read the Bible text. It really helps to understand the comments. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Mathieu. Uh, at this time, um, I'll just invite people, if you have questions, to put them into the Q&A. And then uh, I'll ask uh, Brandon and Jeff to facilitate the questions, um, and then we'll uh, we'll so we'll take a few questions before closing out this afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, so Brandon, I'll hand it over to you and Jeff. Thank you, Bishop Mathieu. Um, we have a question here about um, a connection between the uh, <clears throat> uh, the many sources that you had today and uh, the meaning of the word of God for the faithful today. Um, can you draw out perhaps uh, uh, some more significance of um, reading scripture? Yes, well, this is a very large question. I'll try to give a brief answer. Basically, I think that we, uh, we have to start with the written word of God, the Bible, uh, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, and, but these are very often, for many people, difficult texts to read. So uh, in order, I think that the first step is really to uh, be confronted to the word of God, a bit like Jacob was confronted with the angel when he crossed the, uh, the, the Jordan to come back to the land of Israel. And um, of course, in order to better understand this, the, our, to, we first have to ask our questions, and we might find very good answers. Not only we might, but we will find very good answers in the tradition. But um, how it's easier, I would say, for me to find a, a, a biblical text, because I know the, 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 the order of the library 
them to uh, find, but they are very good tools to find uh, what the tradition says about that text. But they are very, very good tools that are available. For instance, uh, in French, there's a La Bible par les Pères, the Bible through the fathers, in which you have lots of uh, text uh, or uh, the fathers explaining some of the uh, of the, the scripture. Um, and that would be my, let me maybe give a very quick example. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 7, we are to told that the young woman will be with child. And the Greek translation of, the, of that uh, in the Septuagint gave the virgin will be with child. And of course, the first Christians read that in the Greek version, the Septuagint. And they were able to make a link between Mary giving birth to Jesus and that prophetic text of Isaiah 7. Now, most probably the, 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 the prophet Isaiah did not have that in mind when he wrote that text. But that doesn't mean that God intended that text to mean that. And he made it so through the development of the tra tra translation, first of all, and through the interpretation of that text, first by Matthew and also by the tradition, the Catholic tradition after that, that this was a foretelling of G uh, Mary giving birth to Jesus. But it's only one example. Thank you. We have a question about the application of um, some of the frameworks which are used in uh, biblical studies. Um, to uh, De Verbum and uh, other constitutions of Vatican II, um, how does uh, authorial intent and context come into play when rereading these documents 60 years later? Uh, so authorial intent of the council, if I hear you well, and the context. Uh, well, I tried very briefly to uh, to uh, situate the, the, uh, the, 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 the context, which is a very... First, I was dreaming of giving you a whole historical context that started with uh, uh, the, the the Council of the, the Reform, really, and the Council of Trent, and then uh, the uh, the Council of Vatican One, and then the Council of Vatican Two. But this would have been too long for the the the, the presentation I was doing today. So the context certainly was one in which the uh, the Council of Vatican One had started answering the question about revelation by defining uh, papal infallibility about if, 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 under certain condition about uh, truth of faith and moral. moral. But uh, since the, the, the council was ended abruptly by the Franco-Prussian War, the second part of the, of the answer was not, a, it would, the council, Vatican I, was unable to do that. And uh, Questions continue to be issued after that, and uh, there's a, a many, many documents. It, it, we could do a conference on the history of that. We will not today, but th this is certainly the context in which the, uh, the, uh, the, the Constitution was written. But since then, the, the, the uh, many debates were came around. I just think about the the question of the historicity of Jesus. I think that when the, uh, the, there was a third quest, uh, the, the Jesus seminar, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of put in doubt the uh, historicity of the, uh, the Gospels. So this is a debate that was not present at the time of the Council. But I think that the answer of the Council is still addressing that debate. And it could, could be completed. The other thing that was not by giving its blessing to historical critical methods, plural, the council did uh, something great. But since then, many, many biblical scholars uh, declined or left aside the historical critical method methods and focused on the final text. They, they did a synchronic approach to the text, focusing either on the text on the or the effect of the text on its readers. So I don't think that the council, especially in the paragraph number two, 12 of the Verbum, takes that into account. But that means it was not, it was about to be developed when the, the, the document was written. So yes, the document was certainly written under a certain historical con, 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 uh, certain historical context. Yes, the context has changed since then. But I would say that the 
basic truth about revelation that is described in the Constitution still hold. It could be completed by some uh, annotations, I would say, about the questions that were that are in the heart of the theological debate right now. But the principles are there. And one of the nice principles is that not only did the Holy Spirit inspire those who wrote the, uh, the, the, the scriptures, but it's also at work in those who read it, especially within a, the church. Hoping that this maybe too long answer is trying to address this question. Thank you. Do you have any further comment on um, how Dave Verbum was uh, received by the public and by the faithful? Um, how it has affected uh, the church, perhaps theology and scholarship among Catholics, and uh, what we can do from here. Okay, well, first of all, let me start with the, the area I know the best, is the, 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 uh, the scripture as an object of uh, research. Uh, so there was certainly a, a great, this was a great input on exegesis and interpretation of the biblical text with uh, many, many new methods being applied to the text. So it was an enrichment. The uh, problem with that is that uh, we, there are so many methods around that uh, for the poor dogmatic theologian who tries to have a dialogue with scripture, uh, it's very difficult for him or her to uh, find a decent interpretation or a, not a decent, sorry, a decent where you can find everywhere, but a common interpretation of scripture. For instance, in the Pentateuch, uh, most theologians were formed with the uh, I, the uh, Documentary Hypothesis of Wellhausen with J E D N P. So the specialists will understand that. If you open any analysis, serious analysis of the Pentateuch, of course, they will refer to Wellhausen and to J E D N P. But there's absolutely no consensus about this theory anymore. So who do you trust? So that so there's a, a, a a big amplification of the research, which was greatly it, it great, it, which is important, but um, it's it created also such a, a, a large, uh, uh, I would say, spectrum of research that it's difficult for even for a biblical scholar to be up to date in all of that. As for the life of the church, I think that one of the big effect of the council and of the Everbum is their reappropriation of, by the people of God of the word of God, to have direct access to the word of God. One of the things that I did not mention in my presentation, but that was uh, uh, presented is the importance of having new and uh, renewed trans translations of the biblical text. Well, I think that even if you don't know Greek and Hebrew, which is the case of most of our hearers today, I'm sure, you have a better access since Vatican II to better translations and better commentaries. And so, but I would start with the scripture. I think that the scripture is much more present in the liturgy, as we heard last week, in the catechesis of the church. And it's part of our life. There are so many Christians, Catholics, who are gathering together around a kitchen table to share the word of God that will be proclaimed in church the following Sunday. So I, I would say that there was a profound impact and a profound change. And we have to continue and encourage these deepening of scripture, better knowledge of scripture, daily knowledge of scripture, I would say. Thank you. Do you have any comments on or thoughts on Pope Benedict XVI's comments about the historical critical method? Uh, well, I think <laughs> I think that my my uh, what uh, Benedict the Sixteenth was not Benedict the Sixteenth yet in nineteen ninety three, but he was certainly very active. He was presiding the uh, the biblical commission uh, when this was written. And I think that uh, the historical critical method is presented in that, in that document as the foundation on which other methods and approaches of, of uh, biblical exegesis are to be, to be to build on. But there's a certainly a limitation of the historical critical method is that 
it tends to atomize if I, I don't know if I can use that expression to to dissect the, the the word of God and say oh this little part comes from here this little part and we lose sight of the effect of the text in its final form and this is the text that is for centuries has been for centuries and continue to be the word of God God is not speaking through the uh, uh, an hypothetical, hypothetical Q source to these people he is speaking through the four canonical gospels and if we are so much imbued with what was behind the text we forget to listen to the text as it stands down. So I would say let's use the, the the great scholarship and intuitions that were given to us by historical critical methods, namely that we have to respect the literary genres. This is one of the uh, a, a very strong invitation of the Verbum number 12. But let's not forget that the important thing is to receive God who wants to be in communion with us through scripture tradition. Thank you. Another question here. Um, has De Verbum impacted uh, the relationship of the Catholic Church with uh, the various Protestant churches that is uh, in the language of Vatican II, our separated brethren? Mm -hmm. I think it uh, the, the movement was already start, has been started before the council, but it certainly gave a blessing, for instance, <clears throat> when uh, biblical exe exegetes meet together, they always, I think in most of the forum I was invited to attend or to participate, uh, there was no distinction between being a Protestant or a Catholic. We were discussing the word of God. And of course, we could uh, be aware of our differences or the, the different backgrounds from which we were interpreting. But they were certainly a common work on the biblical text, and it was much easier than before to uh, agree on many things. And I, for instance, one of the nice things about is uh, um, about the, the role of Mary, located uh, uh, and, or based on Scripture. I think there were tremendous efforts, ec ec ecumenical efforts, to re on re listen to these texts, re listen again to these texts and to come to, with the Mariology that is really rooted in scripture, while, of course, respecting the Catholic tradition. This is only one example, but certainly, the and I would say that what we have in common, of course, are the sacraments of baptism and Eucharist, but also the word of God, which is uniting us. So this is really a point of unity that certainly strengthen the efforts of ecumenism. So dialogue between the Christian confessions. Thank you very much. Another question here. Uh, how can we promote the love of the Gospels and uh, stimulate Bible studies in Catholic parishes? Okay. Well... <laughs> If we had the answer to that question, I think we would be uh, that we would have uh, found the jackpot. But uh, I would say the first thing to do is to, and I, I'm inviting pastors to do that and priests, those who have to to uh, preach the word of God, both the, the bishops, the priests, and the deacons, that to make sure that they have a, uh, a, a their their homilies are really. Uh, inspired and following closely the text that has been proclaimed. This is the more, the more beautiful the homilies will be, the more, because this is uh, for many, many of our believers, this is the contact they have with the scripture, the liturgy of the word of the mass, plus the, uh, the uh, homily that follows. So the quality of the homilies is a key element in here. But I would so strongly uh, urge people not to limit their consumption of scripture to the uh, the attendance of mass. Of course, it's important. And the, the liturgy of the word has been renewed totally, as we heard last week, by the council. But it's also essential that uh, we take the time to study. 
Some people would prefer to study personally, but I would suggest strongly the, the uh, creation or the support of biblical sharing groups. And a good point, to, there are different ways of doing that. A good point of departure could be, let us read to get, uh, together what is, what's on the menu of the Liturgy of the Word for next Sunday. And many people do that around their kitchen table with groups. Or we one, other ways would be, let us sit and read. For instance, uh, in the, uh, we read this, this year the Gospel of Matthew. Next year, starting with the first Sunday of Advent, we will read the Gospel of Mark, year B. Why not try to have a common reading or a study group that will read the Gospel of Mark from the beginning till the end? That's one of the homework I give to my stu I gave to my students often. Like this, I'm, I'm teaching a course on Pentateuch now. The first homework they had was to read the whole book of Genesis from uh, in the beginning till the uh, the death of Joseph and not to take into account the footnotes, but only the biblical text. You would be surprised about the effect of that on many, many people. So the, these are only two ways, but I think that the Holy Spirit will keep on uh, suggesting us different ways of deepening our relationship with the Word of God, our understanding of the Word of God, and our being able to proclaim the Word of God in our life and in our words and, and deeds, too, which is the mission of the Church. Thank you, Bishop Matthew. Um, we have many more questions, but at this time, I think I'll ask Mark to join us once again. Uh, to uh, give you a proper thanks. Thank you very much, Brandon. And uh, uh, Monsignor Mathieu, you began your presentation providing the context uh, regarding two questions that arose from the pre-council history of divine res revelation. First, which is the source of revelation, scripture or scripture and tradition? And then the second one was, how can we use modern tools of biblical interpretation to understand the word of God written in human words? You then went on to highlight uh, the four great affirmations of De Verboom, that revelation is real, that God reveals God's self, uh, and that that's fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, that revela uh, divine revelation is valid for all times and peoples, and it continues to be shared by humanity through, for humanity through the church. That De Verbum returned the Bible to the people of God in the context of the church's mission to evangelize. So in our uh, work in evangelization and cate catechesis, scripture is uh, critical to that. That we must take into account um, when we are interpreting the scriptures, uh, the author, the text, uh, and the reader, and um, and the uh, operation or the, the ability to use literary genres to help us with understanding. Finally, you provided us, um, uh, in view of De Verboom, the, uh, Pope Francis' response to the dubium on the claim that the divine re revelation uh, should be interpreted in the light of ongoing cultural and anthropological anthropological changes. You helped us to, uh, through your presentation, you helped us to renew and deepen our understanding of divine revelation, its sources and its actions in our lives today. And you've encouraged us to find ways to uh, break open the word of God, to share the word of God with one another uh, and to deepen uh, that revelation for ourselves uh, over time. So thank you very much. Your very busy schedule. I really do appreciate you taking the time to prepare the presentation and to come and be with us today. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Je vous en prie. And thanks to all of those who joined us. Yes, we had almost two, over 300 at one point. So it was great. I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you again, um, Monsignor Mathieu, and thank you to our interpreters and to Brandon and Jeff for your great help. Much appreciated. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.